Thank you very, very much for being here. This is our second session with our business education series. And as you can see from the paper in front of you, this session is going to be dedicated to businesses that are going through their growth cycle. So they've gotten survived the uh, startup period, and we're getting into revenues coming in, and, and, and life's crazy, and we don't really know what to do next. And um, this class is going to be kind of addressing those issues, talking about some technology solutions, um, what to do now that you need to hire employees, uh, you need to make some purchases. Purchases, maybe it's equipment purchases, um, and then you know what education can I get? I, I'm needing some help now. What can we do? So we're going to try and address all of those um, areas of the business in this class. It's going to be classroom style. So any anybody that was at our first session, which was the panel style, this one's going to be more. Um, we're going to have some PowerPoints going on and information. We're going to do questions and answers uh, a lot at the end. If you have some real immediate questions and answers, we're going to try and do two or three after each speaker. But I don't want that to kind of run into the next person's time. So we'll definitely have some time at the end. And then the speakers will hang out afterwards just to answer any additional questions that maybe just relate to you personally. All right, I'd like to go ahead and get started and introduce our first speaker. Um, our first speaker is Jennifer Wilkins. She is our Senior Vice President of Treasury Management at Arvest Bank. She joined Arvest Greater Kansas City in March of 2010. She graduated with a Bachelor's of Science from Missouri Southern State University. She has been in the financial industry for 18 years, and the majority of that includes uh, management experience in the areas of retail banking, Treasury Management. Jennifer is actively involved in the Association of Financial Professionals as well as Central Exchange. All right, Jennifer, thanks. Can you guys hear me? Everybody? All right. Um, as Monica mentioned, today we're going to talk about some Treasury Management solutions. And first off, I want to thank you guys for coming. Um, I know you could probably be spending your morning much, you know, more fun um, opportunities. But um, the million-dollar question that I get asked most of the time is, what is treasury management? And it's, it's actually, it's kind of funny because it's so many services. You know, a lot of times I, I'm, I'm asked, well, would treasury, man would treasury management be a good solution for them? Well, there's so many solutions within treasury management so we'll talk about those. Um, so the official definition is treasury management services are designed to assist business clients with managing funds as efficiently as possible in a manner that is consistent with their company's overall strategy and objectives, whether a company needs to expedite its receivables processing, improve cash flow, or facilitate account reconciliation. So what does that actually mean, right? It's really our job is to find solutions for you, to make your life easier, to make your job easier. You are the business owner. You guys need to focus on your business. You don't need to worry about all the day-to-day -day stuff, and that's really our job. Um, a couple of uh, discussion items that we're going to talk about are the receivable solutions, funds management, payable solutions, and fraud prevention. So five questions I want you guys to consider kind of as we're going through all the solutions and think about, as we're going through these, think about your day-to-day. -day. Think about what you guys do on a daily basis, how you manage your cash. And as we talk about the solutions, I want you to, you know, think, is it, would, it, would this make my life easier? Would this possibly, you know, increase my cash flow? So the first question is, you know, what process do you manage, do you use to manage your receivables? For example, what kinds of terms do you extend? How do you invoice? How do you track your receivables? And how do you receive payments? Next, what process do you use to manage your payables? Again, starting with your largest expense, what kind of terms are extended to you? How do you track your payables? How do you make the payments? Do you make them electronically, through check, through credit card? And what is the process you use to manage your cash, cash position on a day-to-day -day basis? And on a daily basis, how do you know where you stand? And number four, what do you do when you have too much cash? I mean, that, that would be great, right? <laughs> Every day. <laughs> Does that happen? I don't know, you know. And then what do you do when you have too little? So let's, let's go through the solutions. The first one is um, receivable solutions. So that's simply you know, money coming into your business. Um, how, you know, there, there's, there's many ways that money can come in, whether it be cash, checks, credit cards, wire transfers, 
or ACH, or Automated Clearinghouse. You, you'll notice in banking we love to use acronyms for everything, so ACH is one of them. Remote Deposit Capture, or RDC, Lockbox, ACH, and Merchant Services are a few that we'll talk about today. Remote Deposit um, is simply, we, we install a scanner at your office, as well as software, and we allow you to make a deposit directly from your office. So you don't have to come to the bank. You don't have to send an employee to the bank. Um, it's, it's actually a very, very great solution for small businesses, large businesses. We have multi-feed scanners, single-feed scanners. So what, every time I install it in a customer's office, they're just like, How, why did I not have this you know, in the very beginning? This is great. So um, a few benefits. Um, it lowers the risk of lost deposits saves money, you know, that reduction in transportation and courier costs to get your deposits to the bank. You, you have the ability to submit deposits on your schedule. So you can, you can make a deposit. You can make as many deposits as you want throughout the day. It doesn't matter. You know, you're not having to run trips to the bank to make sure that your cash is in, in, in your account. And then we also um, offer dual control capability. So you can have somebody from your office initiate the deposit, and then you can have another person or yourself approve the deposit. Lockbox is the next solution, and it's simply a, a post office box that we manage on your behalf. So your receivables go into a P.O. box, Arvest will, or your bank will collect those receivables and process it on your behalf for you. You know, the biggest misconception I hear a lot with lockbox is, oh, it's for big, big businesses. You know, it's, it's only if there's a lot of volume. And that's really not true because it, you know, depending on um, the actual solution that you, um, that the lockbox solution that you would use, it's really pretty cost effective. And, I mean, it would save, you know, you having to have somebody at your office processing those payments, collecting or yourself. I mean, you guys can be out focusing on the business. A couple of benefits, accelerates cash flow because the deposit's in the bank, guaranteed. You don't have to worry about, oh my gosh, I didn't make it to the bank today. I didn't get my money in the bank. We do it for you. Um, lowers risk of lost deposits again. Improves the accounts receivable efficiency. Provides increased control over credit management and imp improves internal audit procedures. Next is ACH, and that's simply the ability to, tr to electronically transfer funds to and from other entities' bank accounts. So the ways to do it for um, receivables are electronic collection of monthly dues, um, insurance premium drafts, cash concentration, so you know if you're transferring from one bank account to another. Some of the benefits um, save time and money by automating and expediting collection of payments. Electronic entries are quicker and cheaper than checks. And you, you control the timing of your receivables. receivables excuse me. So you are at, you're in control. So, and do you guys understand how that works? You guys are actually originating that ACH or electronic transaction yourself through, the bank, through your online banking. So you're, you're you know, getting an agreement with your customers, and you're actually, um, sorry, you're like, Lost the train of thought. You're actually um, getting their permission <coughs> to collect the payment, and then you're crediting your account. And then merchant services um, is simply credit card accepting credit card payments with Arvest um, or with with any uh, credit card provider. We do um, have an affiliated company, Security Bank Card Center, that we use to process um, a few ways to process merchant services: a dial pay, electronic data capture internet, PC software, and then the newest smartphone application. So you can just accept credit cards straight from your smartphone, which is pretty cool. Next, we'll talk about funds management. And that is basically how you manage your funds once, it, once you receive it through the cash cycle. So obviously, you, you're, you're bringing in your receivables. You're gonna, we're going to talk about payables in a second. But what do you do with the money when you do have it, you know, if there is, if there is some leftover? Um, should I invest? Should I pay down debt? Or should I do nothing? We'll talk about cash manager, account reconciliation, zero balance account, or ZBA, another acronym, and loan sweeps. Arvis cash manager. So basically, cash manager is our 
commercial online banking platform. You know, a lot of banks are going to have different names for different services. Ours is called Cash Manager. It's simply the, the online banking platform that you, you use to help um, view and access your banking accounts. You manage your assets quickly and effectively. Um, I'm not going to talk through the features because um, you can see those on, you know, it's the standard account inquiry, transfers. Um, you can originate at ACH transactions, wire transfers. But the benefits um, that I do want to hit on are, um, one, you have the ability to, to view multiple tax IDs via one login. So we all know how much of a pain remembering passwords, username passwords. We have so many. Um, we do allow, depending on how your business is structured a lot of times, but we will allow customers to have both their personal and their business accounts all via one login. Um, you also have, an, you have administrative control. So you, we, we would uh, allow you as the business owner to either set yourself or maybe somebody in your office that you trust to be the online administrator. And that online administrator um, basically has full control. So then they set up additional users as needed. Maybe it's your accountant. Maybe it's you know somebody that just is doing your reconciliation on a monthly basis. But that that you as the administrator again, or whoever you set as the administrator, um, can control the rights of that user. So they can you you can say you know I want them to only have view only, or I want them to have full access, or I want them to have you know maybe they I want them to be, only be able to do reconciliation. So you have the full control of that. Also, there's, there's dual, dual control capabilities. So again, as we talked about um, earlier with remote deposit, you also, with any kind of transactions, whether it be just account transfers, ACH transaction or electronic transfers, um, wire transfers, you can set up dual control capabilities. So again, you know, if you have somebody in your office that you kind of want to do the day-to-day the -day, um, management of you know, moving funds, that's fine but then you have to you know, approve it at the end of the day or you have to um, review all transactions so you have that capability as well. Let's see. Next we'll talk about account reconciliation. There's, um, so basically a reconciliation is an automated method of, um, by which a business can, customer can reconcile its checking accounts. Um, we'll go through to the, I think we're probably running low on time. Uh, partial and full account reconciliation. So there's two different ways for account reconciliation. Partial is where you, um, we provide you with an electronic file, and then and then you're able to match those against the checks that are presented. Full reconciliation is we actually do everything on your behalf. You send us the checks that you've issued, and we reconcile your account for you. So a lot of people don't know, um, you know, the capabilities of, of account recon, but it's Actually, again, it's one of those other really cost-effective solutions that you, I mean, I, I know just personally I don't like to reconcile my bank accounts. So I'm sure, you know, from the business standpoint, that's, that's kind of one of those tedious monthly tasks that you have to do. A zero balance account, or ZBA, is exactly what it sounds. It's a zero dollar ba bank account. So couple of ways or a couple of times that you would use the ZBA, you know, some customers have an operating account and then a payroll account, and then they have their payroll account set as the ZBA. Or they have maybe an account that you, you want to, you don't want to have the majority of your funds in your operating, but you want to have it in a kind of a sub account that you, in case, you know, just as a, for the rainy day fund in case you need it. You can link those two, and that ZBA account would, would cover any transaction or any um, items that are coming into the operating account that you need to, um, for like overdraft situations. Some of the benefits eliminates the need for businesses to manually transfer between um, funds between accounts, eliminates an NSF fees when transfers between accounts are not timed effectively, and it automates the fund management process. Loan sweeps are the next solution we'll talk about. Um, so basically, loan sweep, there's, there's two different ways to, to, um, that you could set up a loan sweep. So say you have a line of credit in place, you know, working capital line of credit, and you um, want to link that to your operating account. 
you can, you can actually do it both ways. So you can sweep from the loan in the event, again, of an overdraft uh, situation, but you can also um, sweep to the loan. So you can pay down the loan. We set a peg balance in the account, and any extra funds would go and pay down the loan, which would obviously um, reduce your monthly ex uh, interest expense. Next, we'll talk about payable solutions. Um, payables are funds being paid out of a business to suppliers, employees, stockholders, other entities supporting the business operations. Most common ways payables are paid out of a business are checks, credit cards, wire transfers, and ACH. We'll talk about first the Arvest purchasing card. The purchasing card is basically a glorified corporate card. So the requirement for a purchasing card is a 10 card minimum. However, we do have our standard corporate card that doesn't have a minimum. The benefits though with the purchasing card over the corporate card is you're gonna get um, additional functionality, so addic additional online data. So what, what that level three data means is that it's basically the transactions, um, the transaction history of what you know, your employees or um, your spending. There's no annual fee and the um, interest rate is the same as our corporate card as well. Um, some of the benefits, again, are consolidated building, billing. You have one statement. You know, it prevents the need for your employees using your, their personal credit cards and then you having to um, reimburse them and, and um, worry about what they're actually spending the money on. Um, it, it offers you an efficient way to monitor the, the business spending and streamlines the process. You can also do um, expense reporting through our online platform. And it obviously decreases, de decreases the number of checks written, saves time and money, and improves cash flow. Online wire transfers, again, is, is the ability to send wires through Cash Manager. So through your online banking, you have the ability to send both domestic and international wires. And you can set up templates for reoccurring wires as well. Again, you have the, the dual control capability. If you send a lot of wires, it's a great solution because they're half price. I mean, they're, they're cheaper than sending a manual wire, and it's going to save you time. Automated Clearinghouse, again, ACH. So the way you're going to use ACH for the payable is direct deposit. So you're, gonna, you're able to send uh, payroll through, a, through the, um, excuse me, through Cash Manager. Electronic tax payments, insurance premiums, vendor payments. Again, saves time and money by automating and expediting sending of payments. Electronic entries are quicker and cheaper than paper. You, again, control that timing of your payables. So you, you get to decide when your vendors are being paid as opposed to just sending a check and waiting until they um, process it. Next we'll talk about fraud prevention, and that's kind of, nobody wants to talk about fraud prevention, but it happens, unfortunately. Positive pay and ACH fraud blocker are two solutions we'll talk about. Just a couple of facts on check fraud. Since 1999, check fraud has been the leading type of financial fraud in the country. Forged signatures, forged endorsement, counterfeit checks, altered checks. So how can you, as a business, prevent being a victim of check fraud? Positive Pay is the, is the prevention service that works to identify potentially fraudulent checks before they clear your business account. Um, it's often cited as the number one proactive measure in prevention of check fraud. You know, some banks, um, some banks actually require all of their commercial customers to um, have positive pay on their accounts. We don't require it, but we always recommend it. And the way it works is you submit the file that are an issued file of your checks. So the checks that you've written, whether they're payroll checks, whether they're checks that you've, if you're not using ACH, if you're paying your vendors, you submit that file through Cash Manager. And you can do it either like through an upload or you can manually enter the checks as well. Um, if, you're, if you're gonna issue a lot of checks, we obviously recommend that you would upload a file, which we would help you do that. Um, and then we compare those issued checks to what's outstanding or, what, or what's uh, cleared. And then, and then we push a file back to you 
with any exceptions. So if it's, you know, if it's a payee exception, uh, an amount that's not matching, we're going to push those items back to you, and then you get to decide whether it's a legitimate item or not, and you get to pay or receive it. So again, through Cash Manager, you would you would click on the on the link of the check and actually view it. Um, and you know, I'll tell you, customer or excuse me, not customers, the fraudsters, they're not even that. I mean, they're they're not that creative. I mean, they, they don't even do that great of job, you know, they, your signature doesn't even look like your signature a lot of times. And so, but they get away with it, unfortunately. So ACH fraud blocker is the next solution. And one, one thing to point out, did you know that the ACH return window for businesses is only 24 hours? You personally, if something happened, you know, if your, if your account was compromised, um, you have 60 days to notify the bank from the time you actually know, you're, you recognize it. Businesses have 24 hours. So that is not a lot of time, obviously. How can you prevent that? ACH Fraud Blocker is an anti-fraud service that monitors the ACH debit activity on business accounts and verifies the debits presented for payment have been authorized by the business to clear your account. Again, how that works is you give us a list of those companies that you've authorized to debit your account, and we would then compare that list with any debits that hit your account, and if there are any exceptions, again, through Cash Manager, through online banking, you would view those exceptions and you would choose to either pay or return it. So again, you would stop it from ever even going through your account. And if, it's, and if it's a legitimate item, maybe you forgot to, to add it, you can pay it and then add it to your authorized list for the next time. So in review, we talked about many solutions, receivable, fund management, payable, fraud prevention. But I kind of want to just leave you with a few final thoughts. Um, you know, at, at the end of the day, we most most of the banks have the same services, right? I mean, we, we're all they're going to be name different things. You know, they're we all have our clever cash manager and you know different different names for the solutions. But at the end of the day, we we all offer most of the same thing, and we're actually pretty competitive in pricing. I mean, we you know everybody that you try to get other other banks pricing so that you're competitive. But it comes down to the relationship that you have with your banker. Um, that is the most important. You need to make sure that you trust that person, you know, with, as you go through your cash process, cash cycle process, as you as you go through your, your business life cycle, you need to make sure that that person is a trusted advisor. You know, they want to grow with you just as, just as much as you are. They, they offer solutions. So, I mean, in my opinion, that the service and the relationship is the most important. <laughs> Um, we are going to do a, a giveaway, and we can do that in a little bit. But one um, quote in the book that it's called "The Customer Approved Small Business," and it's actually it's actually a really good read. So um, one of you lucky people will get one. But uh, but a quote that was in there at the end that I really liked was, you know, when making uh, key business decisions, you should ask yourself, what is the cost of doing it? But number two, what is the cost of not doing it? Um, you know, when selecting your expert, whether that be your banker, your attorney, your accountant, whomever that could be, you know, a lot of times it's easy for us to say, oh, well, they're the cheapest. I'm going to go with them. But are they the, really the best for you? Are they the best for your business? And so um, you really have to have the confidence in that person that, again, they're going to they're gonna be that a trusted advisor for you. And that's all I have. So if you guys have any questions for me, I'll turn it over. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Hi. Um, with the remote deposit, mm -hmm. we um, have a property management company. So we deal with lots of banks for our different tenants. Mm -hmm. And so when you were talking about the multiple runs, mm -hmm. I mean, it's like four banks a night mm -hmm. that we're having to hit. With the scanner, it, can one scanner be linked to all of those separate banks, or does it have to be a scanner per bank? It would be a scanner per bank, okay. um, typically, typically. Some, depending on the software. So um, some softwares will not, like remote deposit software, will not allow another um, software to be installed. 
So it would really be, we, we could test it out and see. Um, ours is pretty, I mean, you can, ours you can use, typically use with most other banks, so you wouldn't have to necessarily have um, multiple scanners. scanners. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and really that could eliminate the need for even having the multiple banks because you could have scanners at all of your locations or, you know, even your hub locations. I mean, if it was not cost effective to have them at all, but then you and you could have multiple accounts because if you have accounts for each property, you can set up multiple accounts within, you know, w within the software. So you can deposit into multiple accounts as well. Yeah. Is there, I mean, obviously, is there, there's an extra cost for it or is it just something that you get by being an awesome business partner with the bank. Well, <laughs> no, there, there is a cost for the service. Um, and you know, we could certainly talk about that. It's really, really cost effective though, actually. Um, so, and we have, you know, you le can lease a scanner, you can buy a scanner, you can rent a scanner. So there's different options there as well. So wonderful. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Good morning, Bob King with Thought Spray Solutions. Um, on your merchant services, uh -huh. I assume since you have that, can you have the ability to take, take PayPal and Square and all that because that's really a prevalence at conferences and First Friday and mm -hmm. even at Dollar General now you can use PayPal when you check out. That's correct. So we have, um, we actually do have um, our our smartphone application is ex it works exactly like the Square solution. So yep, absolutely. And we and I should have mentioned we actually have. Um, a, a local merchant services rep that um, handles that for you. So, you know, if you have, I mean, we, we love to do a comparison and, you know, because so, comparisons are good, you guys, in, in many ways. And when I say comparison, I mean a pricing comparison because it not only, it, it tells you if you're not getting a good deal, but it also tells you if you're getting a good deal. You know, it kind of gives you that peace of mind that, oh, you know what, actually the person who sold me that <laughs> Was, was telling me the truth, but it might also, you know, be kind of a wake-up call that maybe it's not, so. Anything else? All right, thank you guys. Um, next, we're going to have um, Eric Bunnell. He is our equipment finance um, guru, we'll say. Um, Eric grew up on a family farm in Trenton, Missouri. He received his Bachelor's of Science degree in Agricultural Economics from the University of Missouri. Eric joined Arvest Equipment Finance team in October of 2012. He has over 10 years of experience in commercial lending. Eric works with the Arvest commercial lenders and vendors um, on their equipment finance transactions in the Kansas City, Springfield, and Joplin regions. Eric recently passed the exam to become a certified leasing professional. Eric's going to talk today about the benefits and the differences between leasing um, versus buying. So thanks, Laura. Thanks, Monica. I'm going to try to just stand up here and, and not use the, the other mic. But um, as you can tell, I'm, I'm very passionate and enjoy equipment finance, so I'll try to keep this subject as enjoyable as possible for the rest of you. Um, today, I'm going to kind of give an overview of the different types of um, lease structures and, and where they come into play and different types of equipment that can be leased and then go into the options of, of leasing versus buying. Uh, first of all, I want to give you just a quick background on Arvest Equipment Finance and what we, what we are and who we are. We are a division of Arvest Bank. We were formed in 2007. We are headquartered in Fort Smith, Arkansas. As uh, Monica said, I do cover the, the Kansas uh, and Missouri markets for, the, for our locations. Um, we have over $125 million in our portfolio um, as of last month. And Monitor Daily, uh, which is a, uh, the largest publication in, in equipment financing, they come out with their top 100 list every year. In the last few years, we've made the top 100 in all equipment finance companies in the United States. And when you break that down into just banking, um, we're in the top 50 of the banks um, that offer equipment financing. So not every bank has their own equipment finance division. Um, and the statistic I like to point out from uh, NEFA, which is the National Equipment Finance Association, 70% um, of all companies are going to use some type of financing this year to uh, finance equipment. That could either be a lease or a purchase. And um, the totals are going to be over $640 billion this year. So um, a lot of that um, is due to maybe pent-up demand. You know, with coming out of the recession, uh, companies didn't um, go out and, and buy new equipment. They just kind of held on what they had. And now we're seeing, um, you know, coming out of that, they need to replace it. So uh, 
So that's always interesting. Uh, what is a lease? Um, basically, when you look at what a lease is, it's using the equipment for consideration without ownership. And I'll give some examples later, but um, most of you might know that, but you, you have the use of the equipment, but you don't, you're not the owner. I'm not going to bore you with a long history lesson, but I just want to kind of highlight some, some dates and, and, and kind of the background of leasing. The earliest lease goes back to 2010 BC um, to the uh, Sumerian city of Ur, which is now the modern day Iraq, and that was on agricultural tools. Jumping forward to US history in the 1830s, um, the railroad industry was the big player in leasing, and uh, the railroad companies had um, funding to lay the, the tracks, but they didn't have the, the money to buy the, the rail cars, the locomotives. So what they did is they, they put um, what was called equipment trust in place, and then they would sell these to investors. And um, the most popular plan was called the Philadelphia plan, and that was really a form of a, of a lease early on. And then uh, jump ahead to the 1900s, you start looking at captives came involved, and those were the manufacturers that had their own equipment line and they wanted to be able to offer financing to their customers to sell more equipment. And today, you look at some of the top uh, equipment finance companies in the country, and we're all familiar with Ford Motor Credit, GE Capital, uh, Deer Credit, Cat Finance. So all those companies that, that have their own equipment, um, they're big players in the finance world. And then in the 50s, uh, Congress wanted to stimulate the economy, so they came out with accelerated depreciation for the equipment owners. So if you own the equipment, you could accelerate your depreciation and, and basically um, have, have an expense on your taxes uh, to limit your liability, and that's still out there today. And then in 1976, the Financial Accounting Standards Board uh, passed FASB 13, and what those guidelines were, um, they were to kind of list the criteria that you have to meet for different lessors and lessees um, on how you account for, for leases on, on your books for financial reporting. And over the years, there's always been, it's a, it's a you know, every few years, there's, there's always a change of either tax rule or accounting rules. Um, so we always advise, you know, have a good CPA because they're always making amendments to the, to the rules. Uh, that brings us to uh, today in modern day leasing. Um, you know, the quick equipment industry uh, for leasing and finance is very resilient and adaptive. And, and why, what I mean by that is, you know, even through the recession, there's always a need for, for equipment, and um, it virtually does cover every equipment industry. Um, one of the ways that the uh, finance industry has been adaptive over the years is uh, an application-only program. And most of the finance companies have different levels, but it's just an app only. If, if you would go into a car dealership and, and look to buy a car, you know, and you want to finance it there, you're not going to take all your tax returns and your financial statements and see if you get approved. Normally, it's just a one-page app. You fill it out. They run your credit and see if you, you know, if you fit the guidelines and you're approved that day. And, and equipment finance companies are doing the same thing at different levels. Um, one of the other advantages that we're seeing on uh, that's making leasing popular is uh, to hedge against obsolescence. And this is really in, uh, particular to technology. You know, a lot of the computers and software that companies use, unfortunately, it's usually outdated the minute you take it home. So um, by leasing, you can enter into a short-term lease, use that equipment, and then when you're ready to turn it in, when the lease is over, then you go out and get the latest and greatest toys and upgrade your uh, technology. Uh, we also see it come into play in special use and um, short-term projects. And this would be more maybe geared towards contractors. An example would be if, if you win a bid and you've got a project, you've got to you know, construct a building, and it's going to maybe require some additional equipment that you don't have, but you need it maybe longer than a couple months, so you don't really want to go rent it, but you don't want to purchase it either because you don't know beyond that one project if you've got other work lined up in the future. So you're going to enter into a lease, and uh, when that project's over, you're going to turn that equipment back to the, to the lessor. Um, again, there are tax advantages. We'll go through some of those later on. Um, budget is another reason uh, leasing is popular, and I see this uh, uh, especially on, on the municipal side, but even some larger companies that maybe have several different layers of senior management. 
And some of these supervisors maybe have a budget expense for, uh, for equipment that they can uh, maybe do $500 or $1,000 a month um, and a payment, and a lease payment, but they don't have the authority to go out and, and buy a $100,000 piece of equipment. Um, but they can enter into a, a lease and just continue to renew that and have use of that equipment. Um, and the main thing, and especially in today's uh, economy with uh, everybody holding on as much cash as they can, um, it preserves capital because 100% financing is available through leasing, and um, a lot of companies want to take advantage of that. I get asked a lot, what, you know, what's the equipment that can be leased? And really, you, you look at every company, every company has a need for some type of equipment. The most common out there is commercial vehicles. You can drive down the road and you can see a fleet of company trucks or it could be delivery vans or even maybe their sales staff. Um, they have, um, you know, company cars for their, for their staff. Um, even into the uh, bigger end transportation with the semi truck and trailer. So there's so commercial vehicles are still the number one item that gets financed. Um, computers and technology again. That's uh, those are going to be shorter term assets, usually two to three years, and that that's where that obsolescence comes into play. Uh, medical equipment's another area that we see a lot of financing for. Um, that could be everything from your MRI machines down to your your dentist office and chiropractor offices. They all need um, equipment. Uh, machining equipment, that's, you know, that's your industrial when you look at um, steel fabrication and all your CNC machines, tool and die um, in that industry. Um, construction equipment we also refer to as yellow iron. That's your cat, Komatsu, all the big loaders and dozers and backhoes and, and large ticket items on that. Um, and then one thing that off, often gets overlooked is the office furniture and fixtures. And I, I point up there, and I had up there the landlord waiver, and um, sometimes I get asked, well, I don't own the building. You know, I'm, I'm going to expand or I'm going to uh, do some more, um, take out some more lease space in my current building, and, and I'm going to need some furniture and fixtures. Well, we can still, you can still finance that. And how you do that is you have a landlord waiver, and that document gets signed by your landlord, and basically it, it notifies them that you have uh, taken out a loan or a lease on some equipment that's going to be in their building that they own. And in the event of a default, um, the landlord does not have access to that. Um, so if you don't pay your rent, the landlord can't go in and take your equipment because it's going to belong to the finance company. So, um, And that goes on any of the types of equipment, even on a uh, medical equipment, if you're a, you know, a physician and you're leasing a space and you want to put in an x-ray machine, um, you can still accomplish that with a landlord waiver. And the last one, which really isn't in this market, but you start getting outside of the city limits, is on the agriculture. And we're seeing a lot of demand. Uh, farm income's been up the last few years, and you get into some of those uh, big ticket items with, with the deer equipment. Today I want to just briefly talk about, um, we'll go in more depth on a future, in some future slides, but the three types of the most common leases that are available, capital, operating, and track. And the track is the terminal rental adjustment clause, and I'll give you examples of those. Um, but when we go into talking about leases, there's always two parties in a transaction, the lessor and the lessee. And when I, when I mention lessor, that's going to be the finance company, that's going to be the bank, whoever is providing the funds in that transaction. And the lessee is going to be the company or, or yourself, the one that's using the equipment that's responsible to making the payment. First one we'll look at is the capital lease, and this is a, a structure where um, you're, it's going to be mostly long-term assets that you're going to intend to keep at the end of the at, when the lease term is over. It's going to contain a nominal purchase option, usually a dollar buyout. Most of you have probably been familiar with that. You've heard that phrase before. It's got a dollar buyout. What that means at that last payment on that last month, it's going to be a dollar. And when you make that payment, and a lot of times it just gets weighed because it is such a, a small amount, but the title then gets transferred over to back to you to the lessee. Um, this is structure similar to a loan because it will appear on your balance sheet as an asset and a liability, um, and you amortize it over the life of the lease. Uh, the nice thing is 100% financing is available, which I touched on earlier, which you can preserve your capital. The next one's the operating lease, and this is the exact opposite of a capital lease. Um, you know, operating leases are going to be the ones that you're going to turn back in at the end of the term and back to the, back to the lessor. 
um, your payments can potentially be lower on an operating lease because what we have is an asset manager, and most companies do, and they're going to assess the value of that equipment at the end of the lease term, and that's going to be considered a fair market value. So what happens on an operating lease, you have that piece of equipment, let's say it's a 60-month, at the end of 60 months, you're going to turn that back into the lessor, and we've assigned a, va a fair market value on that, then it's up to us to go out and sell that equipment and get our fair market value for it. You're not responsible for it. You can this is a lease you can actually walk away from, and you're not responsible for that fair market value. Now, at the end of the term, you might decide that you, you want to keep that. You can still work out and negotiate a price, and usually it's the fair market value, and, and retain that equipment. Um, we always advise to talk to a CPA, but again, depending on the, uh, the structure, these operating leases uh, will fall off balance sheet. And the, the, the advantage of that is um, you can expense the full payment on your taxes, which will, again, lower your liability. So. And the last one is the track lease. And this is, um, again, the Terminal Rental Adjustment Clause. Again, we like the acronyms and, and banking and, and equipment financing. Um, this is only used for title vehicles and, and trailers. And this has a you know, a, a fair market value, but it's basically a, a guaranteed residual. 20% is the, is the norm. And an example of how this would work, and this is a really cool product um, on vehicles that we, um, that's starting to grow and gain a lot of momentum. Let's say you had a $30,000 vehicle that you wanted to, to lease. Well, 20% would be $6,000. You would um, go through your whole lease term, and at the end, Again, you can walk away. You're not. Um, you don't have to keep it, but we have to get our 20%. So you turn that back into the lessor, to the to the bank or the finance company. We're going to go out and, and sell that vehicle for the for the most that we can get. If we come up and we sell it for eight thousand, then a check gets cut back to the lessee for the for the additional two thousand dollars because we can't keep more than the 20%. But the the opposite is true as well. If we if we sell it and we only get three thousand, then we're short three thousand. Then we're going to send you a bill for the difference. So we just have to get so you know going into the into the contract what the final uh, amount's going to be due. And um, so the nice thing about um, and again check check with every um, finance company. But for ours, we don't have mileage restrictions. But I can't speak for other companies; they might. But. Kind of a quick overview and conclusion. Um, you know, looking at lease versus buy, we touched on the 100% financing is available on uh, preserving your capital. Again, depending on the structure and with, what, with your uh, help from the CPA, it could be off balance sheet. And if it is, you can expense the full payment, which is a, which is a great feature. I mean, just think about um, all the car loans you've had individually and how much those monthly payments are if you could expense that on your taxes. So companies do have an advantage on that. And it allows you to stay current with technology and, like I said earlier, budget purposes. But, if, again, if you want to look at buying, um, you know, the big advantage of, of owning that asset is you've got ownership and control of it. Um, you are going to be able to have a depreciation and interest expense on your taxes from day one, and it's, it's going to allow you to build equity in it over the time. So that's all I have today. So we have any um, Questions? Yeah. Actually, I have two questions. One, um, with your leases, do you artificially inflate the residual so that it's a lower monthly payment for people like they do with car loans? Because a car loan, people that lease are typically payment buyers for a lot of things. And so they'll artificially inflate the residual value at the end of the time frame so that the, lower, the payment's going to be lower over the course of the term. Is the same true for equipment? Not, not on our end. We really want to make sure that we keep that value as true as possible at the end because it, we don't want to get stuck with that asset at the end of the term and have a residual that's been inflated or higher where we can't get our money back because we, we're not in the business to put higher residuals and then, and then try to sell them at a loss. I mean, we really, we really want to keep it as true as possible, what, what the equipment's going to be worth at the end. We have a certified appraiser on staff, so he's really knowledgeable on all different types of equipment and, and working on keeping those values accurate.
And then secondly, with your lease option, do all of the equipment include like, some sort of a gap insurance included in the lease? Because a lot of times if you lease a vehicle, there's gap, gap insurance is automatically included in it. If you buy it, it's not. It's something you have to buy separately. Does right. everybody know what gap is that I'm talking about? Basically, what gap insurance is is that if something were to happen to the vehicle or to the equipment where it totals it out and the loan that you have on it is more than what the insurance is willing to pay you back, if you don't have gap insurance, you're responsible for that difference. So you no longer have the piece of equipment and you're still paying the difference off in the loan. With most leasing options, you have insurance that's automatically built into the lease. Is that the same for... You, you can't, yeah, you can have insurance and things built into the lease as additional payment. Most of ours are triple net, which means that the lessee is responsible for to pay the taxes, pay the insurance, and the maintenance. Um, you know, that's we don't go out and find the equipment for you or anything like that. You find the equipment, and then we finance it, and then typically it's just your payment, and then um, all those other what we call bundle services. And this is very common too in office equipment such as copiers. You know, some of these lease companies will have it set up like your payments um, fluctuates based on the usage. Ours are pretty much just a flat. Um, every month it's the same. Doesn't matter how much you use it. And but all those other things for the service and maintenances would be on t would be outside of the regular payment. Okay. Good questions. Is that it? Okay. Thank you. I oh, didn't have uh, one. I'm gonna make sure someone. Yeah. Else oh no, you're no. good. Yeah. So. Um, Yesterday, there was an article about Automatic, the company behind WordPress, and how they built their company into a $1 billion company with no physical office space, no email, everybody's distributed. They give their employees an amount of money to furnish their home offices. And so that led me to wonder, you know, could your can the leasing model, can that be used in non-traditional aspects like that with distributed workers or workers from home? I think it could. The only criteria we have on any of our uh, lease products, it has to be a business purpose. So it's not, you know, we're not really set up to do any consumer type financing. So I think if you have even a DBA would work, but, uh, you know, if you've got an entity set up, but it, again, we do a lot with DBA. So as long as you can show that it's a business and not a and, and commercial, not a consumer product. Um, then the other criteria that I didn't touch on that we have is a minimum $10,000. And every company's got usually a minimum amount that they want to finance. So ours is 10,000 and greater. So I think if you met those cri those two criteria, location really wouldn't uh, wouldn't matter. Because the you know there's really lots of co-working spaces in Kansas City, right. and you can dual purpose stuff. You know, hey, I'm going to have an office at home with a computer, and and it seems there could be a lot of value in there. You know, and reduces traffic congestion a whole bit. So I think that would be a good model. Yep. No, I agree. All right, and next we have Anthony, and Anthony Osborne is from Employers Advantage, which is a PEO, and he will explain to you everything about that. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anthony Osborne. Uh, I am, we, Employer Advantage is a headquartered in Joplin, Missouri. Uh, my background kind of comes from the workforce development side, and then I've transitioned into the business side in, in a sense and so today I just want to touch base on on what is offered by PEOs and what we do out of Joplin we're headquartered in Joplin we've been in business since 1990 so we've been around for quite some time we've had a great partnership with Arvis for about 20 years now um, so I'll go ahead and get started uh, just to kind of get a feel for the room how many people here know what a PEO is or a professional employer organization so a few. How many businesses here utilize payroll companies to handle their payroll? I mean, you don't have to, but it, it's, it's not uncommon. Um, well, just to give you an idea, what a PEO does versus a payroll company is we specialize in all four of the categories of payroll, human resources, um, benefits, employee benefits, risk management, and safety. Your payroll companies typically just focus on the payroll side. Uh, and another difference is you got CPAs that will do payroll for companies as well, but they don't take the tax liability off of the company, uh, and we take on that burden as a PEO, and so do payroll companies. So that gives you an idea of the difference between payroll companies and CPAs and what a PEO is. Just to give you an idea as to how much the laws have changed and grown from the 1900s, which there were two, to now to where there's over 100 laws that companies and businesses are required to comply with on a daily basis. And it's very overwhelming. And so that's just, I just wanted to kind of show that to you. And as you can see, the government likes to use a lot of acronyms as well. <laughs> this is uh, typically, this is just a little 
demonstration I like to show everybody. A typical PEO is going to do all of these things for you, A, D, and A, A, D, E, D, A, and A. I apologize, that, that gets tongue twisted. And, and whatnot, workers comp, everything. And then just as an idea as to how much the ACA is going to affect the company in general, the Affordable Care Act, again, acronyms, all these bubbles that are popping up are stuff that companies are going to have to do with the, the, the Affordable Health Care Act now. Whether you're a 50 employee company or not, you still have individual employees that may need to have stuff tracked and to show that they're actually getting their, uh, they, they have insurance that they, they're under because that's an individual mandate as well. And then when you come on to a PEO service and whatnot, we help you focus on just your business. And we handle the administration side, the payroll side, so you can actually work on growing and dealing with customer service. And, and you're all at a point to where you're probably starting to grow and we want to help you grow more. On the payroll side and the taxes side, I just list a few things on here that we can take care of. All your payroll processing. Uh, any in payroll matters as far as if there's a discrepancy or accruals or whatever may come up. Tax compliance, we make sure you're compliant. And if you're not compliant, that's on us, not on you, and you don't pay the fine, we do. Um, we can handle, we give you a, a large employer fill with the payroll on the web. They can go, you can go in and input data and get it all done electronically, save yourself some time, get away from the manual input, uh, manual timesheets and, and whatnot. I'll touch a little more on that in a minute. Uh, direct deposit and pay cards is another area that can save you time, get away from the live check, and we know that that's not going to disappear. It's probably always going to be there, but saves your company money and time when you can go all electronic. All electronic, so it's not all electronic. <laughs> uh, also, we give you a corporate fill with electronic pay stubs and electronic W-2s. Every company has that potential to do that. And some of you may have that capability. I know Arvis, you can get your W-2s three weeks earlier because you do electronic W-2s instead of waiting until the end of February or early February, March and getting it in the mail. So that, that's another, another benefit to small businesses that you may not see every day. And the garnishments, they can be time consuming and auditing and whatnot, we handle that for you as well. Uh, on my next slide, I'm gonna kinda touch base on the timekeeping and attendance just to give you an idea as to how much time you can save with systems that put in place everything electronically. Collect the time, eliminate the time-consuming manual process. Accurate time record, so there's not the 7.25 on this timesheet and then a 7.14 and then you add it all up and somehow uh, the math gets added up some, some way wrong with the decimal point in a different area, whatever the case may be. And uh, many of you may know how time-consuming manual timesheets can be. They are very time-consuming and take away from your time that you could provide for your, your business and your employees. Uh, making sure your employees are compliant with company policy. If you have a policy that you can't start work until five till start time, you can set that up on the, the time clock to make sure that they can't clock in before that. And they're not supposed to be doing work before that time either, obviously. Create reports and help with job costing and labor distribution. If you have to come up with a job cost when you're going out to bid on a job, the timekeeping systems can help with that. And it eliminates the buddy punching. Not literally punching your buddy, <laughs> but how, calling your buddy that works with you, say, hey, clock me in. I'm only five minutes away. I'll be right there. Uh, on the HR side, the human resources side, every company has to have a handbook. Every employee is supposed to sign off on that handbook. They can be time consuming as well. We come in and we can help write handbooks, rewrite handbooks. We have a standard handbook that we can give to any new client and they can utilize that until we get a chance to go through and add on, take away, and then we'll just get everybody to sign it when there's an updated version. Uh, making sure you're staying up with employment practices, uh, employment separations. If you have a situation to where you're not comfortable letting, it go, letting go one of your employees, one of our HR specialists can do that for you and be there. Make sure you have your documentation in place to help protect you so there's not a lawsuit or anything that comes back onto you. Training. Sexual harassment, um, your supervisory trainings, that's stuff that we all come in and do. And I'm going to ask you as a quick question on the, the, um, the, some of the trainings and workplace violence. How many of you, where do you think that stands as far as fatalities in the workplace? It's the second leading cause in workplace. Workplace violence is the second leading cause in, in, in deaths in the workplace. 
when I heard that, it, it threw me off because you think of falling off of a building or equipment, malfunction, something along those lines. Workplace violence is another area that we can come in and help train and do that annually to make sure you're doing what you can because if something like that were to happen, an employee gets disgruntled, comes in, and heaven forbid it happens that we hear about all the time on the news. We can put stuff in place so if that happens, you know, you're going to be somewhat protected and know that you went through this training to try to prevent this from happening in the first place. Job descriptions. A lot relies on your job descriptions when you're hiring and firing in a business, and sometimes those aren't up to date. Sometimes you just throw something together, and when it comes to letting somebody go, they can say, well, that wasn't in my job description. You can't let me go for that. That's your documentation in a sense to make sure they're doing what the, is expected of them to do on a daily basis. Uh, we make sure you're EEOC, employment, equal employment opportunity compliant. Uh, new client orientation, if you have an orientation, we can come in and take that off of your plate for you. Go in and do it, and you, don't ha you can still focus on being a manager or whatever, not take away how many hours out of the day or a week out of for new hires. And onboarding. Onboarding is a pretty big deal when you got to fill out new paperwork and everything. We come to your location and do that with your staff and for you. You don't actually have to do that. Uh, just to give you an idea on the ad administration's cost, this is actually based off of a thousand employee companies or less. When you aren't with the PEO, you're roughly paying about fifteen hundred dollars per employee annually to do HR administration. When you utilize the PEO, you're saving about two hundred dollars, a little over two hundred dollars, an, uh, an employee a year, which can add up depending on what size you are and how much you plan on growing. On the employment benefits side, and, and um, this is what I know that we do, and other PEOs will do this as well, but we have an accidental death and dismemberment for every employee that comes on. It's just something that's there. Our boss or our CEO believes that that's something that should be out there in case that were to happen to a family member and whatnot. They have some way of paying for that expense. And neat thing about, I can't say neat, I apologize, but the dismemberment part, if you were out doing stuff on your own, <laughs> if you're out cutting wood and something were to happen and you, you cut a finger off or something, it covers that. It doesn't have to be just work related. Uh, dental plan is something that we can offer, group life. Medical plan, we don't have a major medical plan that we utilize for everybody. We just have broker a broker in our office that can shop for each individual company. And, and there are some PEOs that actually have a major medical plan that they can put different companies and clients on. And I think we've kind of went away with that with all the ACA stuff and everything going on. We just don't know how it's all going to affect and go from there. Cafeteria plans, term life insurance, vision care. We have a, a local mom and pop eye care company, but we also have a corporate eye care company, different plans that are available. And we can administer your COBRA and state continuation, FMLA, and other medical support orders. Risk management and safety. Pretty big deal when you have a manufacturing company, a warehouse, or, or even a restaurant on making sure you're OSHA compliant and they come in and they're not going to find you. We come in to help prevent that from happening. We have staff dedicated to go into each business and doing walkthroughs on an annual or monthly basis to help make sure OSHA is not going to randomly come into your business and go and try to find you or I, well, I guess they try to find you, but <laughs> go in and find you and so where, that's where we come into play is to help prevent from that happening. Uh, recently, we dealt with the situation to where a company of ours was going to get fined $13,000. We were able to negotiate with OSHA and everything and get it down to $3,100. Much, much, much better than your $13,000 they are going to have to deal with. How many businesses have heard of the new global harmonization systems with OSHA? <laughs> Just so everybody knows. That's supposed to roll out December 1, and companies are supposed to be utilizing it. What that is, is they're changing the data sheets and everything to have pictures for every different danger or chemical spill or whatever the case may be. And it's a, a matter of the right to know or the right to understand what that is. So now OSHA is going to come in and quiz your staff on what does this picture mean when you see it? And what are you supposed to do? Not just knowing that it's a hazard, but how to prevent that from 
being a bad thing. Uh, Department of Transportation, we have a specialist. He actually used to work for MoDOT that can go out to our locations and businesses and actually make sure you're compliant with DOT. Lead safety, we have someone who he actually certified to certify your staff on knowing what lead safety is and how to get it out of a building before you go and try to renovate it or whatever the case may be if that's the type of company you have. Workers' compensation, we do have a workers' comp carrier master plan that we try to get our, our companies and clients onto. Um, but if we can't, we will administer it, help with claims, come up with safety, safety procedures to prevent from reoccurring incidents that happen inside the, the business. And, and, you know, it happens, and we just want to try to prevent it from happening more. Unemployment claims, uh, the 2,500 there, this year alone we've handled 2,500 unemployment claims with all of our clients. And that's something that we take off of your plate as a business so you don't have to deal with the hearings, the quarterly audits, any of that when you're, you're a, a customer of a PEO or us. How many of you have heard of the Integrity Act of 2011? <laughs> that started October 22nd, 2013. Now you don't get the option to fight, uh, or basically you have to turn in documentation for every person you let go. They've done a lot of audits, and they've actually fined companies somewhere around. They've actually found $18 billion worth of unemployment claims that shouldn't have been paid out across the nation. Give you an idea, because of all the unemployment claims and, and people losing jobs and whatnot, there are 19 states right now that owe the federal government money. And the federal government wants it back. <laughs> They're just going to come after it. It's that simple. Well, now you have, to, you have to respond to every UI claim. You can't not respond or be like, oh, well, we'll just let it play its course. That's 99 weeks of money you're paying out to unemployment, potentially. Um, Employers must provide timely and adequate separation information. I highlight we have to have that. You have to have that. You have to send it in to your state so they have it to make sure that, yes? What's timely and adequate? Basically, as of right now, seven to 10 business days from termination. Uh, and that's, that's what it is right now. Now, when you have the in-between, that could be cut down when you, when you are a client that let go somebody and then you need to let us know so we can handle it for you and take care of the hearing, so that could be cut down. So the timing is going to be everything when it comes to that. Um, they are now going having these insolvent states come up with additional penalties and fees to charge for that, that they're going to have to pay the state if they don't get that into them in a, in a timely manner. And if they find a reoccurrence or noncompliance is shown, basically, they're going to start watching you much closer. Uh, they have an information data exchange to where this stuff can be inputted onto a database that you can get it to them so there's no chance of it you know, being lost in the electronic email world or whatever the case may be. Uh, and I highlight documentation, documentation, documentation. You have to have it when it comes to appealing any UI claim, and now you have to basically show that they don't deserve UI or they do deserve UI. Talk about how companies grow with PEOs. This is uh, an Intuit index, and this is January 2009. Companies that utilize, small businesses that utilize PEOs, which small businesses is kind of mis misconstrued because, you know, a 50 employee company is considered a small business compared to a 1,000 employee company. Anyways, and since 2007, as you can see, besides a little lull there in January 2010, PEOs have consistently been able to grow. Their clients have been able to grow. Oh, sorry. <laughs> They've been able to grow by uh, utilizing a PEO. Now, on the other end of it, on the unemployment side, you're able to hire and um, when other companies are on a hiring freeze or they're, they uh, aren't able to hire or whatever the case may be, with the PEO, you're able to hire more so than not by just being a company not utilizing a PEO. And that's all I got right now. If any questions, we can go from there. I kind of went through that pretty quick. <laughs> yes. 
I have a couple of questions. One, my first question has to do with the PEO itself. That's basically, am I understanding it correctly, that employees that work for me in a PEO relationship are now yours? Is that? Only on the tax side. Okay. You, you as the company control everything as far as the hiring, the firing. Uh -huh. We just come in on the tax side on the payroll, and, and it'll show on the check that it's employer advantage, but really it's not. It's just for that purpose. For the tax. Okay. And mm -hmm. then the second question was when you were discussing insurance benefits, does that, uh, does that include if we're in a PEO relationship that the, the insurance that you were talking, as you discussed in your PowerPoint, are available to my employees as well? The ones that I mentioned, we yes. have we have certain ones that are available, and they can right. uh, and, uh, they can choose to do it. The, wow! The medical one is the only one. The medical is the only one we don't have a group for, but we try to broker it out and find you a good plan. Thank you. Yeah, I have a few questions. Uh, she stole one of mine, anyway. <laughs> the first one is: uh, Are you familiar with? Uh, or you do certified payroll with the government, with the state, and federal? Pre pre prevailing wage and uh, Davis Bacon. Oh, can we handle prevailing wage? Yes. Or are you familiar? Do you do? A yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We we we've handled any prevailing wage. We know all of the you need to know about prevailing wage and handle it. We have a number of construction companies and contractors that deal with that on a daily basis. But do you deal a lot with the city, the KCMO? I don't know that we do a lot with Kansas City, but we actually are located. We have companies in 43 states. And we have over 400 clients. Okay, that's because KCMO is just particularly, they have their own system and it's very really tough with them. If you do that, you can do any other state. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, also about OSHA, do you guys provide a booklet for a, a safety booklet for the employees? What we will do is if you already have a safety manual in place, we can go in and help edit it, make sure it's updated. And, and we actually ran into a company recently that they actually have made their safety manual online so there's not the chance of the papers getting and whatnot so they can have access to that but yes we can help with safety manual okay last question uh, do you do a site uh let's say safety meetings let's see if i have employees do you do safety meetings on the site for we can okay yeah, like any of our HR trainings or the sexual harassment, we'll do on-site, or we have electronic database that you can do online or whatever if you choose to. And then we'll have the employees sign off and put that in our electronic database so we can show they've went through the training. I have two questions. Uh, do you offer training, whether that be through the online um, booklets or in-person training in multiple languages? Hispanic, Spanish, Hi and in... Are the two and in so Spanish and English are the yeah. two that you offer, and then do you outsource that training or do you have that all that internally? It's all internally. Okay, and so is how much do you do online, and how much do you do live? It's per the company on how much they want to do. We leave it up to the company on if they want us there or if they're okay just doing it online. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. comment on a question for those that weren't here last week your presentation really emphasizes the point that one of the panelists made about if you make widgets or, or cook food or you know craft quilts if you're doing all this stuff you're not doing what your business is about and so that, that was a big recommendation last week about why some small businesses fail so and and just an interesting fact we learned from a, a I don't know the lawyer in here in Kansas City but we had somebody at a seminar recently and she was learning about UI and all this Integrity Act stuff and mentioned that she was with the PEO and he said to her that ladies and gentlemen that's the wave of the future and the statistics are showing that within the next 25 years 50 percent of all all companies in the United States are going to be utilizing a PEO. Which brings up a question because I agree with that. I, I, I think it makes a lot of sense so where's the break-even point I know you showed us that one that one graph but generally speaking where would the 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 right size company be to really start having conversations with you typically it's typically a five employee company or more or a hundred thousand annual gross and you have three employees four employees you're gonna get right close you're gonna be very close to that because I, I think we'll see more more people going to PEO. I think we'll see more using contract associates mm -hmm. to try and get around some of that too. But 
I think the PEOs are, are certainly going to grow. Yeah, and and they are the the statistic right now is PEs have grown twenty five percent the most recent year. Absolutely. Um, I would just like for you to share too that dealing with the workman's comp, one of the things that um, we have found for some of our, especially contracting companies, it's really good the way that you all let them pay in real time instead of having to pay quarterly, that they can pay <coughs> weekly according to who they're actually using, which is, is very cost effective for these businesses. Yeah, basically when a company comes on and they want us to, to control their workers' comp policy or, or, man, or um, manage it, we will actually pay the down payment or the deposit for the company so they don't have to come up with that upfront money. And then we just take it out on each paycheck basis. Each, each payroll basis. So however much we, however many times we do payroll, if it's bi-weekly, weekly, we just take a little bit at a time throughout the year. And I'll be here afterwards for more questions if you all would like. <laughs> all right, and then our final speaker is Michelle Markey. Michelle Markey, Markey is the Vice President of Kaufman Fast Track, the leading provider of learning curricula that equi uh, Equip aspiring and existing entrepreneurs with the business skills and insights, tools, resources, and network to start and grow successful businesses. Kaufman Fast Track was created by the Kaufman Foundation, the largest foundation whose mission is to advance entrepreneurship as a key to growing economies and expanding human welfare. Michelle has been a feature, featured expert for the American Management Association and has worked with hundreds of businesses to develop their business growth strategy, including Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville Store, University of California, Berkeley, The Gap, Sprint, and Coca-Cola. Additionally, Michelle serves on the Chief Learning Officer Intelligence Board. Michelle holds undergraduate degree in political science, social studies, and education, and a master's degree in business. Follow Michelle on Twitter at she, uh, at she Venture and her, at her blog at www.sheventure.com. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Dave, I don't know if this microphone's on. We're good. Okay. Well, welcome. And um, I hope you're enjoying this business series. I think that there's so much wonderful information that I've learned today myself. And we live in this world in, in terms of, of growing businesses and things that entrepreneurs kind of at top of mind. So it, it's, a, it's a really nice thing that, that you guys have put together, Monica, and we appreciate it. I wanted to talk a little bit about the growing, kind of some of the pains around the growing venture. And I thought it might be interesting to just start by telling you a little bit about my story because I sat and could be sitting in the seats that you're in myself. So it was 1994, and I had been approached. I had some very kind of a unique background. Uh, my undergrad, as Monica said, was political science and social studies and, you know, education. So for a short stint, I taught school um, and was really invested in the political science side of life, and um, I was making about $8,000 a year. And um, some of you uh, know the old De La Salle building down at 16th and Paseo. That's where I was teaching. And it was a wonderful school, but um, they lowered our pay to six. And I thought, I don't think I can make my ends meet. So I ended up taking a job here in Kansas City. And again, since this is a local crowd, you'll know what I'm talking about when I say I took a job at 95th and Troost in the old Bendix building. Right, so at the time I'm just I'm just looking for a job, so I end up getting a job with Bendix, and doing some work for them in production control. So over the years, and, and I had no intention of really staying there really long, but you know during that time I, I dated and started ultimately married my husband, and we started a family. So time kind of got away from me, and so. Over the years I was there, we became Allied Signal and things like that, and I got a tremendous exposure to just a multitude of different processes as it relates to manufacturing. Electrical, mechanical, paint, printed circuit boards, I mean, just every single kind of thing you can think of. In the meantime, I'd gone back to school and got my master's degree, and I never really wanted to get real far away from, from the teaching side. And so I started teaching college in the evenings. Um, I taught at Longview and some other local colleges around here. 
Well, one day I got a call from the American Management Association and they said, Michelle, you know, we really have been looking for somebody that really understands manufacturing, shop floor design, layout, production efficiencies, Kaizen, Six Sigma, uh, and, and we need somebody to help us deliver or to, to develop some training in this particular field. Would you be interested? And at this point, I had just left Allied Signal and was working for a consulting firm. And so I said, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I mean, I love manufacturing. Who would have thought? But I did, because the more I learned about it, the more it became part of a, a, a real mindset to take something and be, be looking at this, this kind of craziness of manufacturing and really look at how do we become higher quality, more efficient, and, and really move through the paces. So long story short, I, I ended up taking the, the, the deal with American Management and writing some training for them. And after I'd written this training, they said, would you like to deliver it? And I said, sure, why not? I mean, I, I, I by background, I'm a teacher. I've been teaching college in the evenings. I really do prefer adult ed as much as I love the kids at 16th and Paseo. Um, the adult ed had way less discipline problems. And so I said, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd love to do that. And it was just a one-off kind of a deal. But the thing is, manufacturing and shop floor, statistical process control sorts of things, and training and being able to talk and work with people don't intersect that often. And so they ended up calling me more and more frequently, more and more work. And so I said, yeah, I mean, I'm really enjoying this. And, and, and frankly, they didn't have very many Michelle Markeys. So I said, yes, I want to do this. Learn more about, you know, warehousing and inventory control. I knew a lot of that. So they said, you've got to have a legal entity. You've got to set yourself up as a business. I mean, obviously I knew that. But keep in mind, this was, this was just like found money to me. It was just kind of a fun thing. I was something really indulging myself that I love to do, but... I hadn't really considered it as my day job. So when I turned in my paperwork to the state, bam, I became Michelle Markey and Associates, right? And that served me well. It's a simple process, and off I went. But what really what I found later, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you, this is a really interesting point to this story because I'm, I'm gonna guarantee you some of you are probably in the same space I was. I was, what I would consider an accidental entrepreneur, right? I was, I was an entrepreneur, but I really didn't, <clears throat> I hadn't put a lot of thought into structuring my business. I hadn't set myself up as an LLC and I'd made the choice to be LLC over other legal entities. I mean, I'd put some thought into it, but this, this was not yet solidified in my mind as a direction that I was gonna go with my career. So I didn't have that, I didn't have mm -hmm. a lot of formal planning. And what we know, obviously, and because you're sitting here, you're, you're probably more aware of this than most, the businesses that are successful today are those businesses where the owner, the founder, the leader are driving that company in a very specific direction. It doesn't mean we have all the answers because I can guarantee you I never had all the answers. But when I became more intentional about my business, I made some choices that, that served me well further down the line. So I want to talk with you a little bit about that. The three that I picked out was really having a strategic plan. When I got that first call from American Management, I, I, I didn't plan beyond that week right? Because it was just a gig sort of a deal. And, and then they do it again. And, and, you know, I was kind of trying to make this work with my vacation. And, and pretty soon I did take the leap and I'm like, okay, yes, I am Michelle Markey and Associates, but I still didn't have anything more than an entity in my mind. I didn't really have a lot of support. And I, to really grow any company, I, I'm going to tell you, it, not one of us goes it alone. There's not one of us that does. And whether that is through relationships you build with your bankers, your lending institutions, maybe even PEOs, other entrepreneurs, people in your community, all entrepreneurs have to get engaged at some level beyond their social circle into a business circle. And, and that's very intentional. 
This is, at the end of the day, what my calendar looked like, and I tried to pick one that really resembled mine. As my business progressed, I realized that I was, and this is absolutely true, getting on a plane every single Monday morning and not getting home till Friday night. I had not one client in Kansas City, not one ever, uh, other than AMA, but they would send me out to, you know, their clients. So literally, I was gone 24-7. And, and it got to the point that it was, um, my business was very, very successful. And for that, I'm extremely thankful. One of the things that I did along the way, when, when, when I'd gotten that first call, you know, the, the manufacturing training they were really asking me for was on inventory control. So inventory record accuracy, how to, how to appropriately cycle count and to how to appropriately conduct physical inventories and those sorts of things. And I knew a, I knew a lot more than that. So over time, I thought I, I probably need to broaden my capabilities, right, beyond manufacturing, uh, just because I, I felt like I needed to be able to to spread about a little bit of what I perceived to be risk. As a sole proprietor, even though I'm running an LLC, I'm thinking, how can I minimize my risk? Because right now, all my eggs are in one basket with AMA and if they need somebody on warehousing and inventory. So I went out and got myself certified as an OSHA 501 trainer. So I could do all the OSHA sorts of training. Manufacturing, OSHA, definitely go together, right? Um, I got myself um, uh, kind of schooled up, if you will, as it pertained to any of the compliance-based trainings, which is exactly why I was asking if you outsource it, because there used to be a lot of us that did that. So HR kinds of trainings, so how to avoid harassment and discrimination, um, any of those sorts of things. So I kind of spread my wealth. But at the end of the day, this was, I was doing as much as I could do. I was running as fast as I, as, as I literally could run. And I was feeling like this. And that is a true story. I'm just like, I'm successful. I'm, su I'm successful. I'm successful. And it's like, oh my gosh. You know, it's like, ah. And, and so the things that, that we've been talking about in here with regard to the stuff that has to happen to just run your business, that's stressing me out. Doing the stupid QuickBooks, oh my gosh. That, you know, that not, was not what I got into business for. I got into business, albeit accidentally, to be able to do the training and to work with the groups. So I needed to find some answers to say, how can I manage both this and this? Because right now, at a certain point, my husband told me, Michelle, something has to change. I missed, I missed my, my youngest daughter. She played competitive volleyball at a very high level. I missed her entire junior year of high school. I didn't see one game. And so he's like, Michelle, something has to change. And I said, yeah, you know what? This is a high-class problem to have. It really is. High-class problem. I've got more work to do than I can do. And a lot of people would be like, cry me a river, Michelle. And, but the truth is, I needed to get very, I needed to take a step back and say, Michelle, you've been successful. Now, you've been successful as an independent. Are you going to make the gap or, you know, kind of bridge the gap and become successful as a business owner. And it was a mental mind shift for me to say, how do I do this beyond kind of the small world that I'm in? And so I chose to kind of kick off or at least bring into this talk something that you guys have probably seen a million times. And it's this quote by Michael Gerber. And it was me. Uh, Michael Gerber, you want to work on your business, not in your business. I was in my business every single day. Every bit of tactical stuff going on, I was the one. But because I was so heads down in my business, I never took a step up to say, where do I see this going? Right? What is going to happen with this? And so it, at my husband's urging, he said perhaps you should go take a fast track course. You know, we're right here in Kansas City with, uh, with uh, Kaufman Fast Track. Maybe you should go do that. And in fact, I did. I ended up taking a fast track course as a business owner. And the things I learned in that class, I, I will tell you for me, 
fundamentally changed the way I ran my business. And what I learned were things that I, I probably knew, but I didn't have necessarily the right big picture framework. One of the things I will tell you is my head in the weeds and my attacking it and getting on a plane every single week, uh, I was leaving money on the table still. But there was no more Michelle Markey. There was as, I was as much as I could do. Yet I'm leaving money on the table. And it started me thinking, you know, one of the first things I did, and there were probably a million things I could have done first, but one of the very first things I did was say, I need to change the name of my company, right? Not only is my mindset saying it's Michelle Markey and Associates, when I sell work, they're expecting Michelle Markey. And that is not always going to be the case now going forward, right? So I, I turned in a paperwork with the state, DBA, changed my company name. And by changing that name, and, and again, this is just my personal experience, by changing that name, it changed my mindset of how I ran my business. And I started thinking of it instead of me, Michelle, mom, mother, person, to business owner, strategic thinker, business leader. I got more involved in the community. I told you none of my customers were from Kansas City. I've lived here my whole life, and I know virtually, I knew at that point virtually nobody in business outside of my family because I didn't interact in the circles in Kansas City business, right? I needed to get back out to that. So I'm going to play a video for you, and I want to kind of set this up because I hope it'll have the, the effect it did on you that it did on me because when you walk out of here today, I want you to think, think beyond kind of what I'm telling you and, and go to what he's telling you. A few years ago, I felt like I was stuck in a rut. So I decided to follow in the footsteps of the great American philosopher, Morgan Spurlock, and try something new for 30 days. The idea is actually pretty simple. Think about something you've always wanted to add to your life and try it for the next 30 days. Okay, it's okay. It turns out 30 days is just about the right amount of time to add a new habit or subtract a habit, like watching the news, from your life. There's a few things that I learned while doing these 30-day challenges. The first was, instead of the months flying by forgotten, the time was much more memorable. This was part of a challenge I did to take a picture every day for a month. And I remember exactly where I was and what I was doing that day. I also noticed that as I started to do more and harder 30-day challenges, my self-confidence grew. I went from desk-dwelling computer nerd to the kind of guy who bikes to work for fun. <laughs> Even last year, I ended up hiking up Mount Kilimanjaro, the highest mountain in Africa. I would never have been that adventurous before I started my 30-day challenges. I also figured out that if you really want something badly enough, you can do anything for 30 days. Have you ever wanted to write a novel? Every November, tens of thousands of people try to write their own 50,000-word novel from scratch in 30 days. It turns out all you have to do is write 1,667 words a day for a month. So I did. By the way, the secret is not to go to sleep until you've written your words for the day. You might be sleep deprived, but you'll finish your novel. Now, is my book the next great American novel? No, I wrote it in a month. It's awful. <laughs> but for the rest of my life, if I meet John Hodgman at a TED party, I don't have to say, I'm a computer scientist. No, no, if I want to, I can say, I'm a novelist. <laughs> So here's one last thing I'd like to mention. I learned that when I made small, sustainable changes, things I could keep doing, they were more likely to stick. There's nothing wrong with big, crazy challenges. In fact, they're a ton of fun, but they're less likely to stick. When I gave up sugar for 30 days, day 31 looked like this. <laughs> so here's my question to you. What are you waiting for? I guarantee you the next 30 days are going to pass whether you like it or not. So why not think about something you have always wanted to try and give it a shot for the next 30 days. Thanks.
So it's in that spirit. I mean, it's a fun talk, right? It's three minutes. But I, I'd like for you to leave here today thinking about your next 30 days. I mean, the fact, again, that you showed up here means you're interested, means you've got something. Um, think about if we were to meet back together 30 days from now, what will you have done differently? I mean, you might choose to do some fun things, but let's think about it from a business perspective. And in the next 30 days, could you have some sustainable, impactful, kind of important things happen in your business? And my, my, my guess is yes. Yes, you can. And so I'm going to give you some things I'd like for you to think about. Uh, first off, I love this quotation by Walt Disney. If you can dream it, you can do it. So here's what I want you to think about. And I'm going to give you some to-dos on these, if you will. One thing we find, we Kaufman Fast Track find, because we work with entrepreneurs all the time, at all different levels, from all different walks of life, with all different product ideas, what have you. And, you know, some of these entrepreneurs are beginners, and that's, that's good. They're just, like, hungry. And then sometimes we work with entrepreneurs, many of whom are probably like yourselves, that are successful. Uh, they are revenue generating. They've, they've got some tenure. And every now and then, Alana and I, we may second guess ourselves. And we'll, we'll say, you know, we're going to share this information, but I wonder if it's going to be really useful to these people. I wonder if it's going to be impactful to these people because they're so advanced. I will tell you, uh, in my th almost uh, three years, in fact, a few days shy of three years, truthfully, with the foundation, with Fast Track, I have been taken aback many times because just when we start to doubt ourselves, what we find is even people like me that own my business from 1994 until, you know, all those years later, there are still things that I walk out and I go, Ooh, I should be doing that. I know that I should be doing that. It's sort of like the New Year's resolution deal. All right. So here's one of them. What I want you to think about is what is your three-year vision for your business? And so if we were to just sit and talk and have coffee together, and I were to say to you, where do you see your business in three years? What, how many employees you're going to have? Are you going to have a building? Or if you're in a building, are you going to be in that same building? What do things feel like? What do they smell like? What are you working on? That is an important question to ask yourself, okay? Because what we want, and it's just like Matt Cutts was saying, 30 days are going to happen whether you like it or not. And hopefully we're all going to like it. That means we'll still be here, right? So in business, it's the same way. So what does that three-year vision look like? And I want you to just think of it this way. I want, these are kind of almost like those SMART goals that, that we've all heard of in management one-on-one -on -one courses. But I want you to challenge yourself and to think big, right? And you'll see that on another slide. I wrote think big on another one, but I want to say it now. Challenge yourself and be very specific about it. You know, it's sort of like you, you have to say, um, I, want to, I want to have, for example, I want to have a broad and diverse customer group. And I could say to you, what does broad and diverse mean? That's very different from your conversation to your conversation to your conversation. So be more specific with yourself, right? So that it's not so gray and intangible. I hope that what you find in this first thing you're doing is this is exciting. This is invigorating. It's a tiny bit scary, too, if you're me, if you're like me. Because when I started to think big, when I started to think, hmm, <coughs> I'm not Michelle Markey and Associates, and I, I did a, a DBA to Heartland Training Solutions because that's really what we were doing. I started going after contracts that I would have never even considered. I had a massive client in Denver, Colorado that was doing a complete systems conversion to SAP, and we're rolling that out, and they had locations all throughout the US, and so they had a whole training deployment that had to happen. I managed and oversaw all that for them. They had over 2,000 drivers, lumber company, millwork, windows, trusses, drivers, hadn't had driver safety training in well over two years. What I told that company is hiring my company 
is cheaper than your first lawsuit. I got that contract. Never would have done it, right? So invigorating, core to your values, right? Core to what you find important, be very measurable and, and provide feedback. These are obvious, but I just want to share that with you. So don't overanalyze it. Just let's just just kind of on your drive home. If if you if you're if you're so inclined, don't get on your cell phone when you leave here. As hard as believe me, I know that is. Maybe not even turn on your radio. Just let this sit with you for a little bit. Think about it. You know, it's interesting. We, I, I, I recently received a questionnaire for a, a retreat that Alana Mueller and I are going on this weekend, and it asks, one of the questions it asks us is, how much time do you spend in self-reflection? And I'm thinking, oh, zero for the most part. I don't really know. I don't think I do. I don't know. I never thought about how much I, time I spend. But the reality is, when I go out and, and go for a run or take my dog for a walk, it's interesting to me because I've noticed this lately. When I come home, I'm usually pretty charged up because somehow something has, I've, I, I, has settled in my mind. I have, because I'm out running or running with my dog, I don't have the clutter of things that are occupying my brain, like the radio or the, the telephone because there's not capability for me to do that there. I don't take my uh, music when I run because I think it's a safety issue. We've always been schooled not to do it, so I've never done it. But the byproduct that I didn't expect was that because there's nothing competing with my brain for thinking, that I come home and I'm like, dang, oh, I'm so excited. So that's it. Think big and just don't do this. Don't say it won't work because... I want you to challenge it. Our world is changing at a rapid, rapid pace. And even for the materials that we have here at Coffin Fast Track, I'm the architect of, of most, if not all, of our intellectual property, all of our courses and all of the things that, that we call Coffin Fast Track. Um, you know, and I'm looking at how do I keep our materials current and relevant and up to date? The thing is, things are moving and hopping and changing all the time. So... This is something I want to stay away from because guess what? What's not a reality today could be tomorrow. All right, second quadrant. I'm going to give you four. Is So here's where I want it to be today. Just clarify that. And then I want you to take a step back and say, where's my business today? All right? So where am I today in terms of how many do I employ? What am I doing? Who are, what are my customers like? Maybe what's the geographic uh, or the DNA of my customer? And is that the same DNA of the same customer I, I'm going to have three years from now? We're going to have more. What, what, just kind of clarify it. So points for you. I want you to think about what is working for you today and what's not. Right? If I were being real in Michelle Markey and Associates, what I would have said was that very full calendar Guess what? I mean, I had money in the bank. Um, we could afford to send our kids to private schools. We could do some of the things that, from a personal value standpoint, were important, but at what cost, right? What was working, what was not? At one point, I say, I can book myself 24-7 and miss 100% of my daughter's volleyball games. And she's the last one. She's the youngest one. Or... I can say, I'm going to take a step back and do something different. But the interesting thing and the lesson for me was stepping back for me was not reducing in terms of dollars. It was becoming about working smarter. When I stepped back from my business and thought more strategically and did some of these things, I made more money that second year after I took Fast Track than before when I was doing it on my own. Right? I started using 1099 Associates. Uh, the driver safety training, I sold them on not just um, the English, but if they had any uh, uh, drivers that were primary Spanish-speaking, first language Spanish-speaking, I contracted with a colleague of mine that is first language Spanish-speaking and has that expertise. So I started to use them. I'm like, what? Never thought about these things. Okay? All right. Here's where the third one is, is where are the gaps? So here's where I want to be, here's where I am. That road is three years long, and I know I'm not going to 
am not going to like close that gap tomorrow. But in three years, what am I going to do? Where are my gaps, right? And so think about when you're thinking about this gap piece, right? What is it going to take for you to fulfill that vision? And it may be, it may be that you say, you know what? In three years time, I intend to have 10 employees, right? I'm making that number up. 10 employees or whatever it is. And maybe this is a time for me to start thinking ahead about going to use PEO because it might make more sense, right? For you as, a, as the head of a growing business, the, if I could give you one piece of advice, and I guess it's a personal, just on my personal opinion, it is you must, you must coach yourself to think strategically versus tactically. For so many of us, we are, we started doing what we're doing because we liked what we did, right? I loved what I did, but I can't do it all. And so I had to be comfortable with bringing additional resources on with complementary skills to start supporting the growth of that business. That meant for me, my hat shifted into leader of an organization. I had to put on my leadership hat. If I'm gonna be hiring these 10 people, they're counting on me and my company for their livelihood as well. So it can't be just me anymore. All right, I love the quotation by Mary Kay. An average person with average talents and ambitions and average education can outstrip the most brilliant genius of our society if that person has clear fo focused goals. I spent a lot of time worrying about what I did not know. I need to get over that. There are a lot of people that are smarter than me. I need to figure out how to work with those people. We have complementary skill sets. That's why, we, that's why we work well together, right? So do not think you have to become a CPA or an IT expert or an HR expert. If there are resources, figure out what that looks like for you strategically. And in your last quadrant, please, I want you to consider what are you doing to stay current and relative, uh, relevant in an ever-changing world? Ever, ever changing. And so let me give you a few tips here because I have found this to be absolutely true. I had no idea I would be standing at Kaufman Fast Track when I own my own business. I had no intention of leaving my own business, right, to, to do this. This is a fabulous and unique opportunity that provided me, it was not a fork in a road. This is a road that's continuing to move forward. This is a part of my path. But what I've realized is that to be relevant and competitive in today's world, you're always having to look at your product, your service, your customers, your competitors. Because IBM thought they were relevant for a real long time. And IBM did not think anybody would ever have a computer in their home. That's just one example. Invest yourself in this community. We are in Kansas City, some of the richest people in the world when it comes to entrepreneurial activities, entrepreneurial ecosystem. And it's not, it's not about hanging with the same people. There are things going on here. I can tell you my neighbors in Lee Summit, Missouri have zero idea what's going on here half the time because they're focused out there. Focus on what's going on in the ecosystem. Get connected, follow the right, if you're not on Twitter, I know a lot of people say I don't do that, probably should. Even if it's just to observe and, and monitor, it's like watching the news feed, the news wire, hear, see, feel, invest in this community uh, and become part of it and you will be amazed at not only the connections but the information that is at your fingertips for free, right, for free. So look where you are in this life cycle. And, and I will tell you, I thought, pardon me for walking in front of this, I thought that by the time I got to Heartland Training, I was here. The reality is every single time I looked at how do I stay current, how do I stay relevant, how do I stay important as a company, I was adding and adjusting it would throw me right back up into startup in, in a way, and that was okay 
because I, that meant I had to figure it out. I had, if I'm adding new layers and new components to my business, then I'm acting as a startup in, in, in some ways again, right? The bottom line for us as growth entrepreneurs, and I'll stop here pretty quickly, is at any given point, we possibly could be exiting, and that's what we all ought to be looking for. And I mean this in a very positive way. I go to the, I come to work here thinking this every day because I thought this when I owned my own company. Every single day, how can I add value to this business? How can I add value? And that's not a kumbaya kind of statement. How do I add value? Because the more value inherent in this business, the more success it is, and that means the higher the price tag or the ultimate value of that company is when the time comes that I make a choice as to how to move forward with that company, right? Whether it's to sell it, whether it's to franchise it, whether it's to leave it to family members. You know, I don't know what your goals are, but you should have some goals. It's just like you tell your, your kids or like I tell my kids. Even if you can't afford it, take a little bit of money out of each paycheck and put it in the 401k, right? It's an investment in the future. And that is your strategic planning is an investment in your business future. And true growth companies really have this mindset. And for you as leaders, that's the hat we should be wearing. Okay? So I'm going to just go to that. That's how you ought to feel. Big success uh, coming out of here. That's how I feel. And I'll end with this. You may never know what results will come of your action, but you will do. But if you do nothing, there will be no result. All right? Thank you. Any and I'm happy to answer any questions. Probably because you covered everything. <laughs> yeah, maybe. And it's almost 10. Thank you, Michelle. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Um, you know, Marion Kaufman was a great entrepreneur. And I'm just curious, is there a connection, I mean, between the fast track? Because I know he was also kind of a learner. Lifetime learner kind of guy. Yeah. Um, is, is there any connection between his vision and this, or is this just part of the foundation? Uh, absolutely. It's a great question. There is a direct correlation between Mr. Kaufman's vision and exactly what's happened with Fast Track. Um, and, and, you know, Fast Track actually this year, and I have some of these things I'd like to actually, if you don't mind, we'll yeah. give those out that better describe what, what our courses are. But, you know, it's interesting. This year, in fact, this month, Kaufman Fast Track is going to be celebrating its 20th anniversary. And so over the years, Mr. Kaufman first, first found what was Fast Track, you know, 20 years ago. And over this time, we've developed it and expanded it and taken it to a whole new level. But it is a direct legacy of exactly what his beliefs and desires and motivations were. And we see it every day. We've had, to date, more than... Approximately more than 350,000 people have attended a fast track course. We are we are located throughout the United States and now internationally, and you know we are experiencing some really pretty tremendous growth as we see more and more people are really looking at entrepreneurship as a viable career option. They're turning to fast track and saying, "I, I need to I need to have some fundamentals on how to do that," and that's what we do. I'm sorry. We do have a Connect Net event. In fact, we are, well, would you like to? I would love for you to. This is Alana Mueller. Hi, everybody. It's President. a pleasure to have you here. Um, in connection with Global Entrepreneurship Week, and you also you all have a bookmark at your place, uh, and there's a website, kcsourcelink.com. It has a ton of information about all the events taking place during Global Entrepreneurship Week. But we have an event that you're all invited to, whether you've taken Fast Track or not, uh, on Tuesday morning, November 19th, from 7.30 to 9.30 in the morning, down at the Roastery on 27th Street. Danny O'Neill, who was one of our very first graduates 20 years ago from Fast Track, uh, is the owner of the Roastery, and he'll be hosting us for a networking gathering. So I hope you'll come. It'll be a nice opportunity for you to interact more with one another and to meet some other folks uh, in this community, as Michelle was pointing out. Okay, I'll write the information up here on the board.
When you leave this room, if you go right back to where the computer room is, there's a thing of brochures and there's a fold out with all of the event calendar for uh, the Global Entrepreneurship Week. And I recommend everybody pick one of those up because there's some incredible events going on during that time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. Any more questions for anybody? Okay, and then we'll hang out afterwards too. Um, I'm passing around a survey, so if you would give us a little bit of feedback. This is our first time doing this, so obviously we know we can improve. Um, so if you would give us some feedback, constructive feedback, if you loved it, tell us that too, because we love to hear that as well. Um, also, we're doing a drawing we mentioned for uh, our book, and it's called um, The Customer Approved Small Business. Um, we gathered some business cards. Has everybody entered that that's interested in entering that? Anybody else? Okay. And do you want to? Oh, sure. And our winner is Bill's Floor Machines. So, yay. Right here on the right. <laughs> <laughs> that made it easy on me. All right. Woohoo. Um, thank you. And we do have um, upcoming sessions next week. It's going to be on Tuesday, not Thursday. Um, we had a conflict with Thursday, but same room, same time. This is going to be all about lending. Uh, we will have, um, we're trying to get somebody from the actual SBA department in Kansas City to come, but we'll have our SBA expert here um, from Oklahoma for our business bank, and then, as well as myself. We'll be talking about getting financing for your business. And then our final session is on the 21st, again on a Thursday. And that one's going to be about businesses that have kind of gotten to that level where things are just going really well, um, cash flows coming in, what to do with that cash, retirement planning, as well as exit strategy. And you're getting to a point where um, you need a plan on what to do next. Um, are you going to sell the business? Are you going to pass it along to a family member? So um, giving you tools and, and um, help on that. And then Michelle is going to be talking about what to do with your experience and your time once you've retired. So hope that you guys can join us. Thank you very much for coming today.